everyone. So what we'll be looking at today is GCP. This is not necessarily your GCP course in terms of going through over the basic elements of food clinical practice. We will highlight those. But it's a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the elements that support what we do. So we'll look at the, the pieces of a functional quality system from a site perspective. So we'll look at the elements of a functional quality system from a site perspective, some of the recent trends in noncompliance, look at the roles of SOPs in good clinical practice and how you probably, I know you, have, you guys have SOPs, but how we use those as compliance tools. We'll look at the differences between the legal and procedural elements of GCP, so what it says versus what we oftentimes do in our conduct of these studies. And we'll look at some of the key differences in pharmaceutical device and biologics as it relates to safety reporting and, and those sort of things and transfer of responsibilities. So most of us are familiar with the common elements of GCP, 21 CFR Part 11. I have that in parentheses because we still kind of struggle with that. The FDA has told us that they're not necessarily going to cite us for departures from 21 CFR Part 11 for those electronic records and electronic signatures. What they have been doing is citing us for failure to maintain adequate and accurate records, for example. We have investigators that have received warning letters because they didn't have disaster recovery or backup for their systems. And again, linking it back to not maintaining those adequate and accurate records. We have final guidance that came out after a couple rounds for electronic source documentation. So as we adopt more and more of these electronic systems, we're getting some more guidance about how to use those systems and how the FDA views their use. Certainly looking at 21 CFR Part 11, informed consent, making sure that we have for example, all of the elements of informed consent in our document, including the requirement that if our trial is an applicable trial and needs to be registered on clinicaltrials.gov, that that information is included in that consent document. I've actually, that's what I was doing last night and this morning is reviewing consent documents for all of the elements. But as an auditor, when we go out, we find oftentimes that that is missing and the template that the IRB is using to review or the sponsor or the CRO or even the site. So understanding whether that trial needs to be registered, making sure that that information is there in that consent document. 21 CFR 54, information about financial disclosure. This is one quantifiable way of the FDA says that we can assess the potential for bias or conflict of interest in our research. We gather this information from investigators and sub-investigators, including information about spouses and dependent children. But what's critical to appreciate here is that it's not just gathering that information and checking those boxes that we do or do not have something to disclose and making sure that we have that paper. But if we do have something that needs to be disclosed, the expectation is that we have a mitigation and management plan in place because we're trying to protect the integrity of our data. And of course, when there's that potential for conflict of interest or bias, it could ultimately impact on subject safety, rights, and welfare. So the expectation is that that is a well-documented and controlled process. We have to work with IRBs that meet the requirements under 21 CFR 56. So where you guys are located, you're doing federally funded and industry sponsored research. You're doing a lot of investigator initiated research. So you have all of these different requirements coming together in terms of the expectations for following certain regulations. You will certainly be following the common rule, 45 CFR 46. But again, 21 CFR 11, 50, 54, 56, 312, 812, what have you. And when your investigators are conducting those studies on their own behalf, they're responsible for complementary elements in terms of investigator and sponsor responsibilities. We have to make sure that our IRBs are structured appropriately. You guys, I think, are pretty, pretty good in that. Your, your IRB is registered as an OHRP, FDA type. We want to make sure that even when we are maybe working with satellite sites and they're working with other IRBs, for example, mostly coming back to yours, but, but working with other IRBs, we need to make sure that they're registered appropriately and we're not just accepting that federal-wide assurance number or that FWA number as documentation that that IRB is in compliance because that just is the IRB telling OHRP they'll be in compliance with the common rule or 45 CFR 46. We know the back of those 1571s and 1572s require us to ensure that we're working with an IRB that meets compliance with 56. So we look at the regulations and requirements for our INDs for 312, our NDAs for 314. So as we start to study these investigational pharmaceuticals and biologics and get th that post-marketing work, and then in 812 and 814 for our IDEs and PMAs, working with our investigational devices, our post-marketing. 
HIPAA, of course, is going to guide what we do. 21 CFR Part 50 talks to us about making sure that we include in that consent document information about confidentiality, and that is above and beyond what we even see in HIPAA and HITECH. So those were updated in 2013, in January of 2013. So this is where we slip back into that 45 CFR, 164, to make sure that we are overseeing those processes and that authorization to include all the elements that's required that we let folks know. A consent tells them this is what we're going to do to gather information, and that HIPAA tells them, that HIPAA authorization lets them know this is how we're going to use that information, that protected health information. ICHE2A, most of us are following this, um, certainly in, in alignment with good clinical practice, safety reporting, again, like the ICH written uh, primarily for drugs. But we do pull it into what we do in terms of even medical devices. We're pulling ICH E6 in. We're following ISO 14155 as well, and those are complementary. But anything we can do really to layer on protect protection, 